for uh, the Committee Against Torture. Um, as many of you know, I'm Yolanda Tomlinson, the National Education Coordinator with the U.S. Human Rights Network. Um, and today's Halloween. I hope the scariest thing that you encounter today is, of course, the U.S.'s record on torture and cruel, inhuman, degrading <laughs> treatment or punishment. <laughs> um, so as many of you know, the network is a national network of organizations and individuals who are working to build and strengthen a people-centered human rights movement and culture in the United States. As a network, leadership is centered on those who are most directly affected by human rights violations, and uh, the full range of diversity and community is respected and embraced. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the uh, CAT Task Force, which is an all-volunteer group of advocates who support members and partners engaging with the Convention Against Torture um, which is only one of three human rights treaties that the U.S. has accepted as law. A couple of things to note before we get started. Uh, the first is that the call is currently in lecture mode. Uh, everyone except the presenters will be muted uh, until we open up the conversation for questions uh, and answers at the end of the call. Uh, at that point, um, you have two ways of participating in the conversation. The first is to use the raise hand feature which is located under the uh, My Mood button on the top menu of your screen. Uh, the second way is through the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and you'll notice that you have several functionalities where you can send questions directly to, to the presenters or you can send questions to the full uh, group. Uh, and you should note that we have quite a few, um, we have a, a a long list of people to participate in the call. It's about 76 people planning to call in, and currently we have about 40 people on the line. Um, and our presenters will be answering questions um, as we go along in the, uh, in the agenda. Um, our agenda for today uh, involves an introduction to Geneva and the United Nations, which will be presented by Marcia Johnson Blanco. Uh, then we'll have an overview of the CAT review process by Eric Tars. Uh, and then a case study looking at the, the Committee Against Torture, specifically the recent Holy See uh, review, uh, and that will be, be by Aliyah Hussein. Uh, after Aliyah, we'll have a schedule of uh, the events uh, and next steps in the coordination process uh, in Geneva um, and what you'll need to do to get started uh, for your um, time in Geneva. And then we'll, we'll end with a Q&A. Um, the call is currently set for an hour and a half, but we're hoping to get through um, in the first hour to be able to begin to take questions in case anyone uh, can't stay for the remaining 30 minutes. So first up is Marcia Johnson Blanco. Marcia is the co-director of Lawyers Committee's Voting Rights Project, where she directs the following uh, programmatic areas, election protection, election reform, census and redistricting, and felony disenfranchisement. Marcia also works to bring a stronger human rights advocacy to U.S. policymaking. I should also note that Marcia is the co-chair of the USHR and CERD Task Force. Marcia? Thank you, Elon. Just confirming you can hear me before I continue? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Great. Well, um, thank you for having me on, and... Um, Welcome to all of those on the webinar. I have the easiest job of the webinar, I think, and the most fun, which is to um, act as your tour guide um, to Geneva. And um, let's see if I can... Oh, there we go. So uh, first, um, as many of you uh, may know, that um, the main language used in Geneva is French. And I have a view here of the city with the famous geyser at the lake, the lock. Um, it's also a very small city, uh, and it's um, very easily accessible and inviting. And so in addition to the lots of hard work that I know you're all going to be doing there, I invite you to explore um, the city. And it is very easy to get around. There are buses and trams. Um, there's a bus and a train from the airport um, into the heart of the city. Uh, and at your hotels, um, the main um, practice is that as you check in, they will give you a bus pass. And so you can get around um, using this pass, it would be the duration for your stay at the hotel. They would be dated um, for that time, and you can use that on all the transportation, the trams, the trolleys, the buses, 
um, to get around. And the bus system is on the honor system. You just get on. Um, there, there's not um, a fair um, check-in when you get on the bus, but you should always have your card with you because there are intermittent checks to make sure that everyone who's on the bus or um, whatever mode of transportation you're on is a fair-paying customer and they're um, really stringent fines. So you definitely want to make sure that you have that pass with you at all times. And uh, there, um, the um, bus is very, um, and the transportation is very easily accessible to um, the two main UN buildings that you're likely to be um, visiting. Um, the first one is Palais Wilson, named after President uh, Wilson, and it is um, an older building, uh, much more ac architecturally um, pleasing, um, but not as um, big or um, technologically convenient um, or has as much space as um, Palais National, which you'll be seeing next. Often um, you would pick up your credentials, um, particularly those of you who are like me who do not have ECHOSOC status but, um, but needs to get a badge for a particular meeting. Um, you would pick it up at the Palais Wilson. Um, there is a um, uh, a, a guard station at the gate where you go and you check in, and it's usually um, if you you know all your paper, paperwork is fine, you go in. They would have your name on a list. They would check you in, and they would have your badge um, ready to give to you. With this badge, you can get into all of the um, UN buildings. And um, it's something that you um, need to have with you at all times um, to access the buildings as well. I see the um, there's a question about um, whether the public transportation system allows for service animals. That I'm not sure about, um, but I'm sure it's something the network would um, follow up on and um, can let you know about. Um, the the city um, is um, has a lot of Wi-Fi everywhere you go, and um, we definitely um, on the trips become Wi-Fi addicts, um, asking for the passwords for all of the systems. And there is Wi-Fi available at the Palais Wilson. So badges, um, as I mentioned, these are your key to um, access. And there's a photo from the March um, ICCPR trip of some of those who. Um, attended. Um, as you will see, some have a, a blue badge. Um, that is for those of you who have um, Echo, Echo um, SOC status. And you, that's the um, badge that you can use to um, get into the buildings. And then for those of you who just are um, for the meeting, you'll get a badge that is sort of the white and um, maroon badge that some folks have um, clipped on, which are particular um, for the, the meetings and, and it's dated badges, I would say is that when you get to Palais Nation, and I'll, um, I, gonna, I should have had a slide there. I wonder if it's, um, some, hopefully it's um, down the line and I mixed up the order. But um, when you get to Palais Nation, there, for those who have ECHOSOC status, you can just use your pass on a um, sort of like a an electronic gate and get in. Those of us who don't have the blue Echo Sock Pass, we just have to go into the line and go through security to get in. But um, that is the only difference I found um, with the badges is how long you have to wait in line at um, Palais Nation. And um, just to repeat, because I see the question about getting the um, badge or credentials, as I mentioned, um, at Palais Wilson, and I'm sure this will be in your orientation materials, you go to the guard gate and give them your um, information, and they will um, give you your credentials. Oh, somehow my Palais Nation slide um, <laughs> got deleted. Um, so I, I'll just go back um, for a moment and talk about Palais Nation. So the, the two um, buildings that you're going to be um, in most frequently are Palais Wilson and Palais Nation. Palais Wilson is the older UN building, 
And then Palais Nation is um, a train ride away from Palais Wilson to um, to the big UN building. And this is the building that you'll see. Um, Palais Nation is the building with all the flags. Um, it's right across the street from this very impressive sculpture of a chair with um, one of the four legs um, amputated. Um, and you get to the bottom of um, the hill there with the, the flags. The, there's a tram that says um, Palais Nation, Palais Nation. You get off there. You're right there um, at the building. But you would need to walk up a hill or take a bus to um, and the other um, entrance because it's a wide compound where you would go through security to get in. I'm so sorry that that... Um, slide is missing because it had both the front of the building and then the building where you would um, most likely enter. You could either um, walk up the hill from the bottom of Palais Nation or you could um, get in, um, take a bus up the hill and, get, and um, get into the main entrance where you would need to enter the building. And the walk is not bad. It's about a 10-minute walk. It is uphill. Um, that's the only problem. Um, if you don't want to um, have too much strenuous exercise before you go up, um, I have photos here of the committee rooms. The one on the top left is the room for um, Nacion, where the um, hearing is um, held. The one on the bottom right is the room in um, Palais Wilson. And um, in each of the rooms, there will be um, headphones. Um, for the translation, the um, room at um, Nacion has these really um, interesting headphones that cup over your ear, and um, in Wilson, it's more the modern um, headphones that you're used to. Um, the Serpentine Lounge, this is where a lot of the business happens at Nacion. This is where you're going to be convening and organizing. Um, it's right outside the main committee rooms. It also has a little bar where you can buy food. Um, I should mention that the UN does not take credit cards, so make sure you have your francs to pay for your food. Um, when you're there, um, the food is excellent. Um, and um, the other thing I should mention, though, that it's very um, expensive. Uh, so um, you definitely um, will need to uh, Try to count your pennies, but the UN compound is a lot um, cheaper than out in the world of um, Geneva. And let's see, what else I have here? Oh, and one thing, you're going to be working really hard. Um, there's always a very challenging agenda for you to make the most of your trip, but definitely go out, see the sites. The old city is where you can get great crepes, reasonable prices, fantastic, amazing architecture. It also has um, a lot of the high-end stores, um, so you can do a lot of uh, window shopping, um, very um, pretty. Um, and you can also get excellent fondue at the Old City. It's very expensive. There are fondue places all over, but um, the ones that the, fond um, the fondue in the Old City are the ones that are best known. And if you have the time, take a walk at the Botanical um, Garden, the Jardin Botanique. Um, which is very pretty, and it's a great de-stressor and a place to um, really uh, relax and enjoy the city. And I think that's all I have, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have at the end. Thank you so much, Marcia, for wetting our appetite um, about uh, Geneva and all of the attractions and how to get started in terms of um, entering the buildings. Um, next up, we have Eric Tars, who will be doing an overview of the CAT review process and how you can expect to spend your time advocating uh, before the committee. Um, Eric serves as a National Law Center, serves as a National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's senior attorney, focusing on human rights and children's rights programs. Uh, in his human rights capacity, he works with homelessness and housing advocates. Um, advocacy organizations to train and strategically utilize human rights as a component of their work. In his youth uh, rights capacity, he works to protect home youth and families through trainings, litigation, and policy advocacy at the national and local levels. 
Eric also serves as the coordinator for the U.S. Uh, NGO Advocacy before the Committee Against Torture and the Human Rights Committee in 2006. Eric? Thanks, Yuan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take you through um, advocating with the committee some uh, uh, some suggestions and uh, and how you can approach things. Um, very briefly, uh, we'll start off talking about setting your goals and lowering your expectations for what you can expect there. Um, and then go through uh, the key intervention points with the committee, which are the formal, informal briefings and side meetings with the committee members, and then think about other strategic ways you can use your time in Geneva. So uh, first, in terms of goal setting, uh, you want to go to your meetings with the committee members, uh, the formal, the informal, and the side, uh, knowing what you want to get out of them. Um, whether that could be just simply a question from the committee that you want them to ask to the U.S. government to hold them accountable, uh, whether you want them to make a specific recommendation, um, uh, if you want to try and provoke a specific response from the U.S. Um, or get them to make some sort of statement there, um, or, and I guess throughout all of this, the, the question is, how will you use this uh, in your domestic advocacy? How can you get a media hook? Um, you can see here on the um, slide a, uh, um, a newspaper article that we got uh, following our third advocacy earlier this year um, where we, we did get the media to hook onto um, the question and the recommendation uh, made by the committee. And so we, we consider that a, a, a very successful bit of advocacy there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, if that's if this is your goal, you want to think about not just going in and saying, I'm going to complain to the UN that, you know, people's rights are being abused, but, you know, with a very specific thought of what is the committee, what can the committee do for me, and how am I going to use it when I get uh, back home? Um, in terms of getting to that point, however, there are uh, many limitations. Um, the first is that uh, you have limited time and access with the committee, just two one-hour formal briefings where all of us as non-governmental organizations are going to be trying to get the ears of the committee members. Um, and so it, it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to have issues, um, you know, that any of us could spend days talking about with the committee members, try to squish it into a two-minute statement, if that, or a part of a two-minute statement. Um, and so that's a real challenge, and you have to think about how you're going to deal with that. Um, the next big challenge is the review itself is a you know three hour session one day three hour session the next day um, and so the committee members only have a limited amount of time um, much of it is taken up you know too much you'll feel when you're actually there is taken up with um, preliminary statements welcoming the U.S. report thanking the delegation for being there um, and when you just wish they would get down to business. Um, but that, that time limit is a very big factor. So, you know, if your uh, question doesn't get asked in the time necessary, you know, you need to recognize that, uh, you know, that it is a limited process and you might not be able to, to get everything that you want out of it. Um, similarly, the committee's observations uh, that they will make, the recommendations that they make afterwards, there's a, you know, limited number of pages that they have. And so things, again, are very truncated. Don't, nothing gets the treatment that it deserves. Um, and so, you know, you, you just have to recognize that in advance and try and do the best with the, within the limits that you have. Um, the government is unlikely to make any shocking new announcements of grand reversals in policy while you're there. So just be aware that, you know, the response of the government to the question is likely to not satisfy you. Um, and that, you know, know how you will be able to deal with that, know how you can spin that in the media or, uh, you know, um, work with the government to improve their response for next time. Um, and then the biggest, biggest limit in terms of the media is that, uh, you know, this kind of activity falls in between. It's not, you know, international human rights stuff that one set of reporters might be covering. It's not the normal domestic advocacy that other reporters are covering. So it falls in this strange space, and you need to do a lot of prep work and education with 
um, reporters to get them to understand what's going on. Um, so, you know, the, to the extent you can anticipate that in advance and work with uh, reporters you know in advance, then that's great. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if you don't get the story specifically on your issue, just be aware that that's, that's a possibility. Uh, so in terms of interacting with the committee, uh, you will have a, the first event will be a formal briefing. Um, the advantage of the formal briefing is that it's translated. Uh, it will be a one-hour session in this room in Palais Wilson, as Marcia said. The whole committee will be there, um, and uh, this is the op one opportunity for NGOs to talk to the whole committee while you're there. Um, the importance is it's a one-hour session. There will be 50 of us there, uh, so we need to coordinate. Many working groups are already have already composed their two-minute statements that are boiling down their issues, and so that's you know what needs to happen in order to, to um, work there. Respect for each other is perhaps the most important thing. As I said before, uh, any of our issues deserves a full day of treatment by the committee. Um, all of our issues are the most important issues to us uh, as advocates. So if your working group happens to be first on the list uh, to speak, you know, give the people at the end of the list the same respect you would want seen um, given to you if you were there. So stick to your time limits. Uh, don't go over and, and make sure that everybody feels like they have as much of a chance to be heard as possible. Um, if the committee members do ask questions, working groups need to be prepared to quickly um, focus a question to whichever uh, person from that working group is best able to answer it. Um, and then, uh, and so if multiple people are covering the same issue, you know, you should be ready in advance uh, to know who's going to be answering which question. Um, and then there's a big question in terms of advocacy at this session. Uh, is it, are you going for the heart or the mind of the committee member? And I think in many cases, our, they've all read uh, our shadow reports or at least parts of them. So we've got, we've made the uh, case for their minds. Um, the uh, formal briefing and informal briefing is an opportunity to reach at their hearts and get them to understand why they should care about these issues. So you can go a little bit less uh, hard on the, the legal or technical details, unless it's a particularly compelling statistic, um, and really uh, help them understand why it's important uh, to understand um, the issues, and then give them the motivation to turn to your shadow report and find out that uh, key information that they need to find uh, in order to be able to hold the US government accountable. Also, you should be prepared at this point to have your one pager, a simple front and back uh, description of your issue and any requests you have in terms of questions or uh, recommendations that they would make that you can hand to a committee member if he expresses interest in your, in your issue. Um, <clears throat> the committee itself is smaller than the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination or the Human Rights Committee that some of you may have encountered uh, earlier this year uh, at the other human rights hearings. Um, the chairperson is a Chilean, Claudio Grossman, but he lives and works in the United States, so he will likely recuse himself. Um, and Felice Gare, one of the vice chair people, is from the U.S., and she will recuse herself um, because the U.S. is under consideration. Um, so that leaves uh, the other members of the committee. Um, the main working languages for most of the committee members is English. A few of them, um, their working language is French, which is why the network uh, translated the uh, executive summaries into French already. So we have that uh, bit of advocacy, uh, you know, already done with the committee members. Um, but all of them speak either English or French. Um, most of them are lawyers. Uh, and so would be open to legal and technical arguments. Um, Mr. Jens Modvig from Denmark is a physician, so if there are specific uh, medical-related arguments to, uh, your, um, to your issue, then he would be a good person to target with those, and he does speak English. Um, but I think that you, many people will find this is a slightly more professional committee than the third committee, where many of the members um, you know, lack 
in certain expertise. This is this is a slightly more uh, the, the overall membership is more serious and um, more prepared to deal with issues at hand. Um, the next opportunity uh, for meeting with the committee would be the informal briefing. Um, the downside of this event is that it is not translated. It's also just an hour long, a very short time span. The whole committee will likely not attend it, but the important people, the rapporteur who will be uh, guiding the U.S. through its uh, review um, and several other members will likely uh, be there. Um, again, coordination uh, within the working groups to know who will answer which questions and respect for each other, keeping any informal responses as short as possible to, to, uh, to give the respect so that other people can answer questions as well uh, is really key for this process. Uh, to be uh, successful. Um, side meetings. Um, the committee members, uh, you know, while they have this distinguished position, are just people and they are often very interested in meeting with non-governmental uh, organizations such as ours. Uh, the ACLU will be putting out a guide to the committee members um, so you can see a little bit of what information that they um, have used in the past in questioning uh, different governments, what topic areas that they are interested in. So you can figure out which committee member it would be li most likely to want to hear about your issues. Um, and then you can try and approach them at either the informal or the formal briefing or some time in between sessions and say, would you like to come have lunch? Would you like to meet for coffee? And they will just, uh, you know, off if they can, they will often say yes and then you can set up a side meeting, um, but again, low expectations. Uh, while they can do it, they they are also human and they have a very busy schedule there and need to um, you know need to eat, need to sleep. So if uh, if they decline or if you aren't able to get a side meeting, you know that's often par for the course there. So so uh, it's a great opportunity, but um, not necessarily one you should set your heart on. Uh, and again. Having a one pager there that you can give to the committee member uh, is the quickest and easiest way of getting your point across. Um, when you're at the hearing uh, at uh, the nation's building, you need to respect the independence of the committee members. While they are often very much on our side as non-governmental organizations, they, um, they can't appear to be too much in our pockets. Um, and so don't be uh, trying to whisper to them uh, as uh, the, the hearings go on. Um, instead, uh, if you hear something from the U.S. government or you know something that the committee members themselves are misrepresenting and need clarification on, um, or if you know the government says something and you say that's just you know outright wrong, uh, write a quick note and then hand it to one of the committee members in between the sessions uh, so that you know they have the information that they need. Um, other strategic considerations, meeting with um, you know, the U.S. government will have a consultation in Geneva. You should be prepared uh, to, you know, make statements at that if, uh, if you've signed up to do that um, and think about how you can use that time to your advantage. Um, you can meet with other uh, staff at the U.N., uh, special rapporteur staff, talk to them about mission visits, about doing um, inquiries into different issues here in the U.S., so take advantage of the time that you're there to meet with them. You can meet with um, mission staff, embassies of other countries uh, to prepare for the universal periodic review process and get your issues uh, on the table with them. I've already made uh, an appointment to meet with the Norwegian embassy because I know that they commented on, uh, on one of our issues during the last universal periodic review, and I want to to follow up with them and hopefully get them to ask a stronger question this time. So that's another great way to take advantage of just being in Geneva. Um, there are press who are walking around the UN building. There's a, a press office. You can go down there um, and you know leave copies of your one pager with them and see if anybody uh, wants to get in touch with you and talk more about it. Obviously, have your contact information on it so they can get in touch with you while you're in Geneva. Um, and then really be thinking about how you're going to bring all of this stuff back to the U.S. Um, the, in the entire time you're there. Uh, we often do daily video updates uh, from while we're there, just post them on YouTube. 
so that the people who have worked with us on our reports back home feel like they are part of the process. Um, you can be tweeting, you can be writing blogs, um, you know, uh, you can be thinking about, you should be thinking about how you're making the process in Geneva relevant to the, the people you work with, uh, to the media you work with, to the public officials you work with back uh, in the U.S. Um, so those are uh, the five big things I wanted to get out, um, and uh, I'm happy to pass on to Aliyah to talk a little bit more about uh, working at the UN. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, can folks hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, sounds great. Um, okay, so this past May, um, CCR, along with our partner, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, SNAP, um, went to Geneva for the Committee Against Torture's review of the Vatican. Um, so using the Vatican as a case study, I thought it might be helpful to discuss some of our formal and informal engagement with the members um, and takeaways from that review that could be useful for November. Um, and then I'll end with a few examples of successful media, public education, and other advocacy work that we did in conjunction with the review. Um, and hopefully that will lead nicely into what Cindy will be talking about later. Um, so part of preparing our strategy for Geneva last spring was understanding the broader context in which the review was playing out. So for us, this included timing and messaging in the media um, and recognizing opportunities and challenges they provided. So on the timing front, um, this was actually the first time the Committee Against Torture was reviewing the Vatican, um, and it was also the second time in four months that the Vatican was called before the UN to account for its human rights record on addressing the ongoing worldwide crisis of sexual violence and cover-ups within the church. Uh, so in January 2014, the Committee on the Rights of the Child reviewed them and subsequently issued pretty strong concluding observations. Um, so the positive for us going into the CAT review was that there was momentum and our advocacy efforts were really gaining traction. Um, and importantly, the CRC provided the CAT Committee with recent um, treaty body language that it could reference during the review. Um, and which it did a number of times. Uh, the challenge was that there was CRC backlash. <laughs> so, for example, the Vatican warned um, the Committee Against Torture not to give in to pressure from strongly ideological NGOs, uh, which were seeking to force their agenda onto the proceedings. Um, so this concern about objectivity um, did come up throughout the session, and the committee, I think, was sensitive to it. Um, and it also kind of came up in, in press coverage. So additionally, um, our preparation was also shaped by what the civil society participation looked like for the review, um, which is quite different, I think, than the, the U.S. review. So there were eight shadow reports submitted, um, nine groups in total participating in person in Geneva, um, and there were only a handful of main issues that were covered that week. Um, so one was sort of the committee's mandate and U.N. reform, um, extraterritorial jurisdiction, uh, clergy sexual violence, um, and to a slightly lesser extent, abortion as well. Um, so in addition to our shadow reporting, um, as Eric mentioned, there were two major opportunities for us to engage directly with CAT members in Geneva. Um, so the private NGO meeting um, was organized by a Geneva-based NGO, the World Organization Against Torture, OMCT, um, and they were tasked with coordinating um, all the NGOs, um, much in the way that the network is doing right now. Um, and because of the small number of groups participating, um, I think each group got um, a substantial amount of time. Um, and SNAP, our partner organization, was able to um, read a detailed statement. Um, so to the extent that there was survivor testimony in the private NGO meeting, I think that was really critical. Um, of course, you know, in the U.S. review, the number of um, civil society organizations is huge, but also the range of issues. So um, I would just you know, urge us to um, definitely coordinate and to prepare, I think, as we have some concise but powerful statements. Um, immediately following the lunch briefing, um, CCR co-sponsored, um, yes, yeah, we co-sponsored the lunch briefing, which was incredibly impactful. Um, two of the committee members attended. Um, Felice Gare from the U.S., who's the vice chair, um, and then to Gucci um, from Georgia, also a vice chair, and actually the country rapporteur. Um, and as Eric mentioned also, um, it's less about numbers and I think more about the quality and interest. Um, they were very interested in this issue. It was clear that they were well informed, that they had read the shadow reports. Um, and, you know, the entire briefing was pretty much focused on survivor testimony, which was really powerful. Um, and I think this is where we get to the hearts of the, the committee members. So SNAP connected their own stories um, with the advocacy that they were doing at the UN and, 
and I think made really specific recommendations to how the CAT members could support those efforts through questioning in the coming days. Uh, the committee members were clearly moved by the personal accounts. They asked really sophisticated follow-up questions, um, and the survivors, I think, felt like they were really heard. Um, and so my own personal reflections is that the um, private NGO meeting and the informal briefing like, absolutely shaped the specific line of questionings and points that the committee raised during the review. For example, the case of my colleague was brought up, I think, three different times by different committee members, um, mostly because the Vatican wasn't actually answering the question. Um, so following that um, briefing, we did do a press conference, which I'll talk a bit more later. Um, and then in terms of the actual review, you know, the questions fell into a few categories, I think some of which might be helpful to keep in mind for the, um, for the upcoming U.S. review. Uh, the first was that the committee engaged on the issue of extraterritorial application of the convention. Um, there was a focus on general comment three and the right to remedy, Article 14, um, and my colleague gave me a note saying that the committee is understandably very proud of this new um, general comment. So NGOs, especially those representing victims and survivors, should press this. Uh, the committee also asked detailed questions on accountability mechanisms, so legal framework um, for prosecutions and lots of numbers. Um, so, you know, what cases, what, what structures were in place, you know, to deal with accountability um, as well as redress. And, you know, a note for all of us, and one thing that was really amazing to see is just how the committee members were um, pressing specific cases and specific statistics. Um, I think that came from both the shadow report as well as the NGO briefing. So the more that, you know, we can provide them with specific cases to lead them through the questions in the area, the better. Um, they seemed really prepared to, like, name victims, name survivors named perpetrators in that case. So hopefully, um, you know, that will be helpful to our advocacy. Um, and I also want to stress that it's really important to be strategic about the information you provide in these informal settings. And, you know, Eric touched upon this as well. But, you know, we don't want to overwhelm the committee members with information. But if, you know, there are questions we hear and, you know, we can quickly follow up in real time with additional information um, upon request, that's, that's really great. Um, okay, so in terms of specific questioning by certain committee members, um, just to flag, um, Gare and Taguchi were the two most vocal at the questioning, which um, isn't a, wasn't really a surprise given their engagement in the NGO and informal briefings and their interest. Um, Gare was excellent, and early on she addressed the committee's mandate over the issues and also addressed the extraterritoriality jurisdictional issue. Um, Belmere came back again and again to child victims of torture, focusing on children. She also focused on the role of religion, expressed concern about religious extremism, as well as the lack of respect for different religions. Uh, Taguchi seemed focused on Article 14, impunity redress mechanisms, um, and Chairman Grossman seemed particularly concerned about the perception of the committee and that it was not overstepping its mandate. Um, and I think we kind of felt like he was maybe overly respectful to the state, uh, but was, was likely responding to the ongoing debate about UN human rights bodies needing oversight. Um, you know, for example, I think he said the committee didn't want the Holy See to think it was applying double standards, um, and, and its legitimacy depended on its being perceived as fair and impartial. So in terms of advice about advocating before the committee, um, again, I think Eric touched upon a lot of it, but uh, the survivor testimony was you know, really critical, I think, in that review, and, and I would urge that wherever possible to um, create a space for it. Um, the CAT members not only responded well to it, but I think appreciated um, having those first person accounts um, and, you know, incorporated them in the questioning. Um, advocacy one-pagers could be useful as well, but again, be strategic about the information that you provide. The more specific and relevant, the better. Um, and again, seeking out informal opportunities to engage with committee members, um, especially if it's just a follow-up on a quick question that you heard them ask that you wanted to, um, you know, give them additional information. Um, I think that they would, would welcome that. Um, and then outside of interfacing with CAT, you know, there's so much that organizations can do in terms of their own advocacy. Uh, for us, we um, had quite a, an aggressive media push. Uh, we issued multiple press releases. So we issued one when we submitted our shadow report. We issued one um, when we got to Geneva. We issued another one um, after the questioning. 
Uh, we also held a press conference before the session um, with the Geneva Press Corps. And, you know, like I said, we were just there a few months earlier um, on the Committee of the Rights of the Child Review, so we had some good relationships there. Um, and then, you know, for press, we made sure to have copies of our report handy. We had speakers' bios ready. We had a few um, fact sheets translated into multiple languages prepared. Um, and we also made time in our schedule um, so that people could do press interviews in person and on the phone. Um, you know, a few times folks were sort of yanked out of a, you know, a meeting or part of the review um, to do some press, um, which was great. And, you know, I think we succeeded in shaping the conversation and ensuring the survivor voice and accountability piece were central. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you have a communications team or, or folks kind of prepared to help with um, press, you know, I think that could be a good, um, a good opportunity to get your issue out there. Mm -hmm. um, and we also engaged our supporters in a number of ways, um, including Facebook, and we tried wherever we could to use photographs in most of our social media, and I think you'll see a few examples in the PowerPoint. Um, we also were huge live tweeters. Um, we had a few people in our in our group, and I think we were all kind of live tweeting at some point. And our colleagues back in the U.S. who were watching the live stream were doing the same. So it made for pretty dynamic, um, you know, conversation across the ocean, which was great. Um, and we also sent an email alert to our supporters with a link to the UN live stream so they could follow along. Um, and then at the end of the session, we did a Google Hangout in the evening where we did a live report back and interactive Q&A. So it was a great opportunity to share our impressions on the ground um, and educate others on what was happening. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes this gets lost in the planning conversations, but I think it bears repeating, you know, as an advocate being in Geneva for these reviews and kind of hearing high-level officials um, talk about the issues at the heart of your work is really exciting. And, um, you know, I think people think it's exciting. So um, I would encourage you all to take advantage of your presence um, and trying to connect it back to the work that you do at home um, in, you know, sort of all these different advocacy ways, whatever works best for your organization. Um, I think I think that's it. I know I went through that pretty quickly, and my PowerPoint didn't um, completely correlate with what I was talking about, but I'm also happy to answer questions. Um, and provide some additional information to the network to email out. Thank you so much, Aaliyah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's the computer has been <laughs> acting a little funny. Um, but I didn't get to do your introduction, so I'll just let folks know that um, you are the Advocacy Ma uh, Program Manager at the Center for uh, Constitutional Rights, uh, where you manage public education and advocacy campaigns around unjust detention um, at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and as part of the legal team there, you travel to Guantanamo Bay regularly to meet with CCR's clients. Um, and you also work on efforts to hold individuals, including U.S. and foreign government officials and corporations accountable for torture and other serious human rights violations. So thank you very much. Um, Aaliyah will also be available at the end to answer more questions about um, her recent visit before the committee, in Geneva and before the committee. Uh, next, we have Cindy Suhu, um, who will be talking about how to maximize your time um, do, uh, using your CAT working groups. Um, Cindy is a director of the International Women's Human Rights Clinic at CUNY Law School, where she supervises projects focusing on reproductive health and rights, uh, human trafficking, and youth in adult jails and prisons. She also she has also been involved in the U.S. reviews before uh, UN treaty bodies since 2005. Uh, Cindy is the current board chair of the U.S. Human Rights Network. Uh, Cindy? Hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, uh, thanks so much, Yolande, and, and the other presenters. Um, I'm Cindy Sue. I'm the director of the International Women's Human Rights Clinic at CUNY Law School. Um, before, I wanna, uh, before I start, I want to thank the network and the task force for your amazing work. Uh, providing tr training and support um, for us as we go through this process and also for taking on the crucial role of coordinating us all. So thank you guys. Um, as Yolan said, I've been working on U.S. reviews before U.N. treaty bodies since 2005. And for me, it's really been an amazing experience to be – I found it really to be an amazing experience to be working shoulder to shoulder with activists around the country. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn from each other and to work together to push the U.S. to respect human rights. Um, and since uh, 2005, we've really seen what an organized U.S. delegation can accomplish. At each review, the U.N. committees have addressed a broader range of issues and have really provided more detailed and meaty recommendations. 
And I really think that that's because we, as a, as a U.S. civil society and, and the U.S. human rights movement, have pushed them to do that. And and also because we're getting better and better about figuring out the kind of information they want, they need and want and providing it to them so that we can get a really good result. Um, so um, as our numbers and our numbers and I think our broad participation of people working on different issues um, is really a strength, but uh, it can also be a challenge. Um, this is a, a screenshot which, sort of, which shows the UN website that shows the reports that came from the United States. And um, there are about 66 reports that the committee got from the United States. And usually when countries are reviewed, they only get three or four. Um, uh, maybe, well, they might get three or four reports. And um, similarly, our delegation is quite large. I think we're actually more around 60 people. You know, and most countries may only get um, three or four people from uh, NGOs in their countries to participate in the review. So I think the UN is really excited about our presence. I think when the United States is there, there's an energy in Geneva, but I think they're also worried about how to manage this large group, and that's why the Secretariat has reached out um, o over the last few reviews and asked the U.S. Human Rights Network to help to coordinate the U.S. groups. Um, and just a word, I think Eric said a little bit um, about the process, but um, you know, the committee is really made of unpaid experts who are volunteers who are reviewing seven other countries. Um, as well as processing individual cases and doing other work during the session. And the U.S. Human, the network has done an amazing job in working with the committee to try to get us as much time as we can. But I think there's a limit to how much time we'll get, as Eric discussed. And we really need to be organized to maximize our effectiveness. Um, and I think the task force is mindful, and rightfully so, that we are the people who know our issues best and should decide our priorities. And that's the reason why we have working groups, to organize us and to allow us to define our priorities. Now, uh, let me say that um, working together in working groups isn't always easy. I think, as Eric said, um, we're all passionate about our issues. That's the reason why we're activists. Um, it's also, it also takes a lot more time to coordinate than to do it alone. And um, so even if you're normally a patient, an open and zen person, Here's me on day one. I think I was very uh, open and zen and excited to be in Geneva for the ICP review. Um, as, as time goes by, you're going to be jet lagged and over caffeinated and tired from running to meetings and staying up late. And so by the end of the week, or I think actually this is me day two, uh, you're going to look more like this. And so we just have to keep in mind, you know, that we're all going to be tired uh, and jet lagged and just. Uh, keep trying to work together. And it's worth it because I think it's rare that we get to hold the U.S. to a higher authority um, and to be before a body that really shares our, our, our values and commitments to human rights. Um, and it's also a rare opportunity for us to get to do it together with all the new friends and, and from people from across the country. So here are just some thoughts about how to work um, effectively. The first thing I think we have to do is to collaborate, and I think it's really important for working groups um, to, tr to start to collaborate, and I think people have already in terms of um, working together, um, meeting, and trying to figure out how uh, to jointly identify your issues and priorities. Uh, hopefully working groups have already come together to draft their joint statement for the informal briefing. I'm sorry, for the formal briefing. Um, I think the other thing that we can be doing is thinking about the, the different opportunities that we're going to have uh, as a group and figuring out how to allocate um, responsibilities for speaking in different forms to different people. So as Eric said, in addition to the formal briefing, there's going to be an informal, there could be an informal briefing, there's going to be a meeting with the U.S. government, there are going to be side meetings. So we can think about how we're uh, spreading out those opportunities. And also, um, usually, you know, our hope is that these meetings are more of a back and forth with committee members, and if they're really engaged, they're going to ask questions. So we also want to um, designate people who might be the key respondents for questions. Um, and then for people who are not going to be going to Geneva, I think it's, it's, it's also key to collaborate before and during the review um, and to be involved in helping to, to craft the, the group's uh, formal statement um, and also to be getting your materials to people who are going to Geneva. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is focus and prioritize. Um, I think Eric talked about this, you know, we're not going to get that much time um, and we need to think about how do we summarize our issues in a concise way and really think about what are the recommendations we want um, because we're not going to get that as many as we'd like. Um, the other thing is I encourage everyone to be flexible and patient. Uh, despite all the task force's work in trying to um, prepare us and to organize us, 
things are going to change. New meetings are going to get scheduled. The committee may have emergencies to deal with, and, and they might end up giving us less time than we planned ori originally. Um, there might be questions that they have, and they might actually want to meet with us to follow up on our submissions. So be prepared, um, but go to the review knowing that your two-minute pre presentation may end up being one, and just be, be, be ready to roll with it and roll up your sleeves and, and get it done. Um, the other thing I think that we need to do um, is to communicate. Um, I think changes are easier for, for, for working groups to deal with if you sort of set up a good chain of communication. So you should figure out where everyone is staying, maybe plan to meet up and check in with each other at the end of the day. Um, maybe create an email list with everyone in your working group, both people who are going to be there and people who are go going to be uh, back in the U.S. And that way, if issues come up or if questions come up, um, you can email and you have, you know, you have that lifeline in terms of you have experts who might be, not be there in Geneva but can help you answer the questions that may come up. Um, for people who are going to be in Geneva, I suggest, I think, trying to use um, apps like WhatsApp or um, I can't remember, Viber, I think, is the other apps um, because um, Wi-Fi is widely available, and if you use these apps, you can create a working group, um, a listserv for your working group. Um, the other thing I think we should do is um, share knowledge and share space. Um, being in Geneva and being surrounded by activists working on different issues is really an amazing opportunity for us to learn about new issues and to make connections with people who are working on similar issues in other parts of the country. So really take advantage of the opportunity to learn from one another. Um, and on a related note, there are going to be people in Geneva who have more experience lobbying at the UN or who have other experience in other types of advocacy work like the press or social media. So really try to share your knowledge and connections with others and be open to making space for them. Um, okay. Um, the other thing uh, that I really want to emphasize is just to, res and Eric did this as well, uh, is just to respect each other. Um, during the first review that I took part in, in uh, 2005, I think uh, we were here in New York um, for uh, uh, the Human Rights Committee, and I think eight people had signed up to, to speak at that briefing, and uh, the committee had allocated a certain set, uh, amount of time, and only six people got to speak. Um, and we can't let that happen to each other again, and that's why the network has set time limits, and so when you see stop, please stop. And I'll stop in one minute. Um, I just want to end with two closing thoughts. Um, uh, one is to say that it will be mentally and physically exhausting, but exhilarating to be lobbying in Geneva. Um, but as hard as we work, I think the, the, net, the courting center and the task force is working even harder to make things smooth for, uh, for us. So please be nice to them. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that given the really excellent reports that have been submitted, we should expect that there will be strong and damning concluding observations from the committee. But I think more important than these observations is the human rights movement that we're building. And I hope in addition to fiercely advocating on our issues, we also impress the rest of the world with our support of each other in Geneva uh, and at home. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for those uh, super critical um, insight about how to maximize our time in our work group, Cindy. Um, Tara uh, DeMont, um, our CAT coordinator, is next to look at the schedule in Geneva and next steps. Um, but before I introduce Tara, I wanted to say that um, that we will be going over the hour before we start taking questions, um, but I think it's critical that we do that um, in order to get what um, Tara has to say. Um, so if you need to leave before the hour, uh, please type your question in the chat window, and we'll be sure to ask them and have them answered. Uh, and the resources from this call, both the audio and the PowerPoint, will be made available to folks um, pretty uh, soon. I can't say this afternoon, um, but at the latest Monday. Um, so be sure to send us your questions if you have to get off early, and we'll be sure to answer it um, before we close the call. So next is Tara DeMont. Uh, she's a Convention Against Torture Coordinator for the U.S. Human Rights Network. Uh, Tara comes to the network with over a decade of human rights experience and advocacy with various human rights organizations, most recently Amnesty International, where her work focuses in, on women's human rights. Um, Tara is based in Oakland, California. Uh, Tara? Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. Um, so I want to thank everyone who just presented already and everyone on the call. 
Um, a lot of this was covered and covered extremely well. So some of this I'll be skipping past a little quickly, but I wanted to highlight just a few things for people on the call that I know that many people have been emailing me with questions and we wanna make sure that we have a sort of general sense of what's happening as well as a general sense of the importance of working together, which has been highlighted, and then what you can expect and can't expect from the process. Um, so the first is just a calendar, um, and I should say that we will be sending out today a Geneva Civil Society Guide, which will include the calendar and all this information in one PDF for you to print and or have on your device um, so that you always have it with you. Um, People are arriving Sunday and Monday, and on Monday at 2 p.m., we will be having our civil society or orientation at the Geneva Business School, which is very close to the Hotel Eden and very close to the UN grounds. Um, and again, all of this will be on a, a physical guide for you to have a map. Um, it's really important that you're there for the orientation, uh, partly just to orient you in the most physical way to the spaces and how we're moving forward, but also because this is then the beginning of physically interacting with your working groups and each other so that we can make sure this process runs as smoothly as possible. If you're flying in after the orientation for some reason, or if your plane touches down late, um, then we will make sure that you get that information and you can just flag that um, for me via email. Tuesday is our really busy day. Um, Tuesday, we start at noon. Well, we'll probably start a lot earlier than that, but we officially start at noon um, with our formal meeting um, with the UN committee. And that's the meeting that both, air, air, well, everyone's been talking about, in which our working groups will be reading their two-minute statements. And we want to emphasize how important it is that people stay on time and working groups are nominating individuals to read these statements. And you've all been working together already on these statements and I've seen drafts of them and they're really incredible. Um, we are not the only organizations there. Other organizations that haven't been working with the network um, will also be there. And so the time, it's a very delicate dance. Um, and the UN is very strict on time. And the UN is very strict on time um, in all these processes. So we, I just wanna overemphasize here that, that our time in, as an individual organization with an individual issue has to be balanced against the approximately 60 other organizations and issues that are there. Right after that meeting, um, and this is in the uh, Palais Wilson, the really beautiful building that you were shown at the beginning, the sort of pink architecture. Right after that is an informal lunch briefing with the CAT committee. And I think Eric highlighted this as a, um, a place where you have another opportunity then to follow up informally with members, um, particularly English speaking members. If you do speak French, that is a huge advantage. Um, and highlighting issues and answering questions. I want to note that a few people have mentioned the one page advocacy document. We're going to be asking the working groups this week. We're hoping that your two minute statements are done and we'll be checking in. Uh, but this coming week, we will be asking you to produce this one page document on your issue. This would be a physical document you hand to someone, not something you read from. And this would be then the place that if a committee member had a follow up question and came to you, not only could you or a representative from your working group answer that question, but then you'd be able to hand over this document um, as um, as additional tangible information for that person to carry. Later that afternoon, um, not too much later, uh, we will be meeting with the U.S. government then in the U.S. government consultation. If you have not RSVP'd directly to the U.S. government, please email me and I will resend you that invite. You have to RSVP directly to the U.S. government to attend this. And this is an opportunity then for the U.S. government and the civil society organizations like yourself um, that are there to connect um, around a variety of issues. One of the things we're emphasizing here is we know that the U.S. government is prepared, that they have talking points, um, and our job is to make these issues real and to, to hopefully get the U.S. government off these talking points to have a sincere conversation about how we can move forward um, to implement important changes. Um, that being said, I also want to highlight that the U.S. government is solely responsible for the talking order, and so you need to RSVP to them, and they will be outlining this order. Um, and again, as far as everything else, it's really important to remember that time is extremely short, so we're looking at one or two minute statements on an issue that, of course, is extremely important for you. Um, so thinking about how you can do the sort of elevator pitch version of your issue is gonna be really critical at every moment during this process. It's the two minute version of, you know, hundreds of pages of research and thousands of hours of work. Um, so please think about how you can consolidate your messaging into the sort of critical ask, 
and the critical issue. Um, this U.S. government consultation is unfortunately at the Palais Nation, which is up the grounds from the Palais Wilson. So, um, and there's maps that will be included here. We'll all be going together, so it, it shouldn't be too too problematic. That evening, then, the U.S. Human Rights Network, along with a number of other organizations, is co are co-sponsoring um, a site event at which we will be featuring um, uh, people who have been directly impacted by um, rights violations uh, pertinent to the Convention Against Torture and Degrading and Cruel and Degrading, degrading Treatment. Um, and then, um, and that is back at the Palais Wilson. This is a really critical opportunity. Um, the UN is invited and often UN members will come, particularly for the first part. Um, they may sneak out the back, but uh, they will be there for the first part. And this is an important opportunity where we hear pe from people who are directly impacted um, and who can share their brief story about how, how and why this convention matters on a real lived personal level. It's also a critical time for us as individual NGOs to connect um, with each other and think about ways to move forward, not just in Geneva, but then of course when we go home, which is where this advocacy begins to really become real. Um, on Wednesday, officially, the U United States review will start. We are invited to that, but we are invited to be silent observers to that. Um, and then there's a few other opportunities, like a tour of the Palais de Nation, which is um, not required, but a really exciting opportunity. And then Thursday, um, we are working on um, meetings with special mandate holder staff, but um, just know that some of these meetings are in flux, and so we will be getting back to you with a final schedule whenever we can. The official Thursday event is the 3 p.m. United States Review, um, in which, uh, again, we are invited to be there um, as observers as the United States and the UN, um, or the United States is reviewed by the UN. That evening, then, we're asking that everyone who comes with the network um, comes for a debrief in the Serpentine Lounge. And this is a really critical, we're all going to be really tired, as Cindy um, pointed out. And my hair already looks like day two, so it's, it's only going to get crazier as we go and get more tired. Um, but it's really important that we then consolidate back together and think about how to move forward and not just um, that we survived this process. Um, but we will be celebrating that evening at 7 p.m. at a very close um, location at a local bar or pub just to relax together, to celebrate and to informally, um, informally consult with each other. Um, so some of this has already been covered, so I won't review this again where you get your credentials. Um, and there's someone asking, about credential logistics that I'll come back to. Um, we've talked about badges already. This is where the orientation is. The Geneva Business School, it's the building to the left, the circa 1960s apartment building look one. Um, and that's where we'll be having orientation. It's right around the corner from the Hotel Eden where the scholarship recipients and a lot of the US Human Rights Network staff are staying and where many people um, are staying. Um, and I just want to give you a physical look of this because many of the buildings are, sort of have the same vibe. And so it's it's important to get a sense of where we're going. Um, I want to, again, highlight the importance of working within working groups. Um, it can be very frustrating when you have an individual issue um, for which you are very passionate and is very important, um, not just for you, but of course, for the people that it directly affects. But we have seen before in reviews that the most effective advocacy at the UN is not when an individual tries to raise an individual issue, but when a working group um, or a representative from the working group tries to raise that issue in a broader context. And that helps make it more meaningful for the UN and actionable. So I want to highlight not that not only is good solidarity and being um, a, a human rights advocate, not just for your individual issue, but for your team, but also as the most effective way to get your issue um, raised and remembered by the UN. Um, so we will, at the orientation, be having working groups talk together, but I would encourage you to use non-scheduled time to work with your working group members. And there will be a list that is in the CAT delegations guide that we'll be sending out today, which highlights all the working group members and then um, specifically bolds the ones that will be in Geneva, so you'll know who to look for. Um, we, I know everyone is working now to build your two minute statements, but please check in back with your working group to make sure that you are now building a one pager that you could potentially distribute to highlight, as um, Eric said, that it's hard to know specifically when these opportunities will, will arise, but it's important to be prepared when they do. If for whatever reason you are not part of a working group yet already, there are nine um, and a half working groups. Um, there's national security, general prison, immigration, issues affecting youth, police crimes, right to rehabilitation, death penalty, political incarceration, and then um, women, LGBT, and identity. 
There's a final one, which is gener on general implementation issues. Um, and so if you have not joined a working group or if you think, oh, actually, I'm also should be connected to this other working group, please feel free to email me hopefully immediately so I can connect you with that working group without delay. Um, we've reviewed already the, the UN buildings. I just want to give you a sense of the spacing between the buildings. Um, you'll see that down in the bottom right is the Rue de Pac, which is um, the, ho the Hotel Wilson, which is also the uh, Palais Wilson. And then the top left, is the Palais Nation. Um, it's about a 28 minute walk um, and it's about a 19 minute public transportation ride uh, via the, the bus system, the city bus system. So um, just plan accordingly and wear shoes that you can walk in, which is important, um, and know that we'll be going back and forth between these buildings. Almost directly in the middle um, uh, is where, our, where the hotel is, where many people are staying. Um, I just want to say a few more words about the site event on Thursday night, um, which is an opportunity for many of us to hear and listen and coordinate, but then for some of us to speak about this experience. Um, this has been a really powerful event in the past, and we know that the UN um, has been present at this and then has incorporated these uh, concerns and stories that are raised um, back in the questions to the United States government. So this is a powerful opportunity for us to not only talk about, as Eric had mentioned earlier, the, the sort of more intellectual questions around the Convention Against Torture, but also then the, the lived experience and, um, and the really important effect of the, of the convention when it's not followed or implemented. We, um, as I, gosh, um, was mentioned before, um, we will be having a, a press and media strategy as well, and we encourage you to be involved um, as in whatever way you can with your is your organization or as an individual. The first is before Geneva, which is where we are now, um, in that we will hope that you will send out press releases and begin press interviews in your local media, perhaps doing blogs or website updates using Twitter or Facebook, et cetera. Um, and if you do, um, you can, of course, please CC me and I'll let our um, our media consultants know so that we can highlight these and then amplify them even more. The more um, uh, we can build some momentum, the better uh, press coverage we'll have there. And then of course, the more uh, difference we might be able to see, the larger difference we can see when we come back home because more people will know about these issues and be lobbying for them. During Geneva, um, we will be um, we will be using social media and blog posting. Um, we hope that you will be using social media as well, and that will be in the guidebook. We have um, the the CAT delegation guide. We have specific hashtags, which you can see here: UN CAT and End Torture. And we hope that you tag us so that we can consolidate all these messages. We also invite you to share pictures on our Flickr. Um, and then, um, and we are looking for people to potentially do blogs well in the process. And if you are interested in that, um, if you are interested in that, please let us know. Um, we will, I'm not sure if we have template uh, blog press releases, but we can certainly generate some, um, which is a question just asked. It's a very good question. Um, after Geneva, uh, you will be exhausted. I will be exhausted. We will all be exhausted. But... That is in many ways where the real work begins. And so it's really important when you come home from Geneva that you are on the ball, releasing press releases, doing media interviews, and then doing local pitching so that this process, which just happened, stays fresh in the public's mind so we can make some real momentum around it and not just have Geneva be the sort of like one week that, that happens in Geneva and stays in Geneva. We don't want this to be like the Vegas of advocacy, right? We want it to come home. We want it to um, trickle out into the public and we want people to be aware of this process and interested in it. So that follow-up post-Geneva is really important. You might even think about doing some of that, um, getting some of those pieces in place beforehand so that when you come home and are tired and of course a week of work you have to catch up on, that you're ready to go because you've already started to make some of those connections already. Um, as was very helpfully highlighted, um, the Geneva, the Swiss are, are one of the very few countries uh, that does not use the euro in Europe. They use the Swiss franc. It is about a dollar. It's a little more than a dollar right now, but exchange rates vary. Um, let me just emphasize that you need to pull out some actual cash, particularly for the UN uh, coffee shop. 
Um, and um, otherwise, though, you might be able to use your credit card. In most places, you'll be able to use a credit card, but you need to contact your credit card agency individually and call them to, one, find out what type of fees you may have, and two, make sure they know you're traveling abroad so that they don't cancel your card because they think it was stolen. Um, everyone should have a passport at this point. If you don't, please contact me immediately. Um, and you should have RSVP'd already for the UN um, accreditation documents. If that doesn't sound familiar to me, to you, or you're not sure what I'm talking about, please email me um, right now during this call um, so that I can connect with you. Um, ground transportation in Geneva is wonderful and free, uh, but you need to get a ticket, as was mentioned, from your hotel. When you get to the airport, there will be a kiosk where you get a free ticket for the ground transportation. We've included a picture of that um, in our guide so you can see what it looks like. Make sure that you grab this so that you have it. You can get on the bus. It makes things a lot easier. Um, Geneva is delicious, so that's fantastic, thinking about meals in Geneva, but it is expensive. Um, it's one of the most expensive cities in Europe. Um, so plan accordingly for your own needs um, and um, think about ways. There are multiple kebab shops all over, um, so your meals will depend on sort of what you access or what you bring um, and when you're hungry. I will sort of mention that um, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but when I don't eat, I get pretty loopy or loopier and um, and distracted and also a bit grumpy. So um, you might think about bringing some granola bars or something to sustain you, particularly during Tuesday, which is a very long day, um, so that you have some energy uh, to keep you going. So um, so that's a, a sort of I know we all know this, but it can be really easy to forget the sustainable things in life like sleep and eating when you are trying to figure out all your documents. Um, the final two things that I'll highlight as um, just things to think about while traveling anywhere is that you need to call your phone service directly individually to see if you can get coverage. Most phone services have the capacity, but will have um, extra fees. If you don't call them and use your device abroad, you can get a huge extra fee as opposed to if you arrange some sort of service for the week. Um, most phone carriers do this and you just have to call your phone carrier directly. And I would do that as soon as possible um, because you don't want to have a case where you're not sure if you can use your device or to what extent you can use your device. Um, as was mentioned, there is Wi-Fi all over Geneva. And so at the very least, you should have access to Wi-Fi, uh, free Wi-Fi at multiple places. And things like Viber or Skype are great ways to make sure you can stay in contact for emergencies without having to worry about extra phone fees. But do call your server so that you're, you're sure about these things. Um, finally, the language in Switzerland, uh, well, there's three, but in Geneva, it's mainly French. Uh, but Geneva is a very international city and many, many, many languages are spoken. Um, I do want to highlight, though, that um, this is particularly important for the UN committee. Um, I am really bad at this speaking slowly <laughs> because um, English is not the first language of most people on the committee. Um, in fact, it's like the fourth language of many people. Um, so it's important when you are speaking to people that you speak slowly, um, you ask for any clarification if you're having trouble understanding, et cetera. Um, finally, I want to again <laughs> implement, talk about implementing the buddy system. It sounds a little regressive, I realize, but actually some of the feedback from our um, time at CERD, the Convention to Eliminate Racial Discrimination in Geneva, um, was asking for this system to be more officialized. And so on Monday during the orientation, we will be asking people to identify um, a person that they can just partner with for information, for checking in, for walking places together. And we're hoping that people who have been in this process before will reach out to people who are new to this process. Some people are extremely new to the UN process, whereas some people have been through this many times. Some people have never traveled abroad, whereas some people travel abroad every other day. Um, so we want to make sure that, that people who are less comfortable with the process can just be paired with someone who has a little more sense of what door you go in through the UN, and yes, this building is the right building, um, and things like that. So please be prepared to be um, to be that partner, um, both um, as someone who might need more information, but or and to someone who may be able to give more information. If you have not let me know if you're traveling to Geneva, uh, you need to do that. So please email me. And this will obviously be um, on the recorded version, so I won't linger there. Um, I do want to highlight then in the last two minutes here to um, to 
talk about bringing this work back at home. And we're going to talk a lot about this after Geneva, but I want to highlight it here so you can build those um, building blocks. The first is to make sure that you've joined a working group. If you haven't, please email me and I, I will connect you to an appropriate working group or working group. The second is to participate through social media. Um, and this is more than just sort of sending a ping out in the ether. This is making sure that we can connect to the conversation that's going on. Um, if you are at home and not coming to Geneva, there will be live webcasts. They are at really weird times on Wednesday, which is 4 a.m., but on Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern and 6 a.m. Pacific. That should say Pacific and not Central. Um, that's a little easier. Uh, so that those are ways you can stay involved as well. But they'll also be recorded um, parts of this. And so uh, I, I believe on the same uh, website, you may be able to, to take parts of that um, and, and watch it back home. Um, so we've gone through a lot of information today, and we want to thank everyone who's on the call, and I want to specifically thank the previous presenters who were so phenomenal. Um, if you have any questions, um, which many of you have been chatting box, chat boxing them, that's fantastic. Or you can use the raise hand feature um, to ask a question, and I'll yet let Yolande um, facilitate this portion. Thank you so much, Tara, um, and the other presenters. You guys did a fantastic job. Um, and you've done an excellent job of weaving in um, responses to the questions on the side chat. Um, I just wanted to go through um, some of the ones that were asked for the people who were on the phone only and not also online. So we had a question about uh, the public transportation system and whether or not it allows service animals to accompany um, disabled people on, on board um, and whether or not that's also allowed in the public um, taxis. So unless any of our presenters besides Marcia has a response to that, um, the answer that uh, Marcia shared was that we're not aware of that and so we can actually check into it because during the ICCPR trip we did have um, someone with a service animal and so we can look into it and then um, send that over uh, the listserv. Eric, um, Cindy, do you have any other response to that particular question? Okay. Um, and as a number of people have uh, reiterated, yes, Wi-Fi is available throughout Geneva as well as in the uh, UN buildings. Um, and that might be the um, cheapest and best way to stay in communication with folks, um, even on your phone while you're there. Um, the question was about how do you get your badge um, and credential materials, um, and how can we figure out badge and credentials and or official documents to attend and help coordinate logistics um, to get to Geneva? Um, Tara, I think more so the piece on um, official documents, um, more so than the badges, because I think Marcia and you and maybe also Aliyah mentioned that. Sure. So if you have not, the way to sign up to get a badge um, for the UN is that you have to um, send a document into Adele Quist, who is the UN coordinator for the accreditation. If you did not receive the emails um, about that documentation, you need to email me absolutely immediately so that I can email you that information. It is past the deadline, but um, you might be able to email an apology with your document and hope that Adele will, will be able to process the accreditation. Um, if she has the capacity, she seems to be very accommodating, but it, it just it kind of depends on the capacity. Um, but so uh, please email immediately if you have not turned in a document to the UN directly. Um, and then, of course, once we get there, it's the process of walking to the Palais Wilson, or Palais, uh, yeah, Palais Wilson and um, picking up your document with, or uh, picking up your badge with your document printed out. So you do need to print out your document. If you um, have already turned it in, please print it out because you'll need to bring that physical document to the UN Security Office. Um, and will this also be in their welcome packet? Are we providing one of those as well, Tara? Yeah, um, no, the document itself, the, the blank document. Not the document, no, but just more directions on. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We have it. The only thing slated for um, Monday is the orientation and then a big reminder on the calendar to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and there's a question about uh, recommendations for economical restaurants um, and places to eat. Um, again, this was answered on the side chat, but um, I'll echo, um, I'll let Eric just sort of say what he's um, written to um, the chat, uh, just in terms of uh, best ways to eat while you're in Geneva. Sure. So basically what I said is, um, you know, my usual approach is if your hotel has breakfast, you know, take advantage of that, eat a big breakfast. Um, many of them have kind of the European style 
croissant, eggs, granola, yogurt, um, uh, some fruit. So like stock up on that, uh, you know, eat a lot there. And then if you can grab a banana, grab an extra croissant for the road, um, which I usually use to sustain me uh, through much of the the day. Uh, the uh, Calle de Nacion has uh, not just a serpentine lounge, but a large cafeteria with kind of foods from all around the world in it. It's subsidized. Um, it's not, you know, absolutely cheap, but it's much less than anywhere else. And, you know, you can um, get a, a very good meal there for as good a price as you're going to get it anywhere. Um, and then uh, somebody mentioned granola bars. I highly endorse that. Um, there are uh, a couple of grocery stores, um, including one called Manor, um, that's down near the train station in Geneva. Um, you can buy stuff there, stock up on some extra fruit, some, uh, you know, bread for making sandwiches. Um, I usually try to get through the majority of the day just using, um, you know, breakfast and then other food that I've either gotten from the grocery store or, um, you know, maybe going to the, the cafeteria, um, because many times you're going to find that you don't really have a, a huge chance for a lunch break in any case. Um, so it's good to have food that you've packed along with you. Um, and then in, in many cases, your day will go until six or seven in the evening. And then you can, um, you know, knowing that you haven't spent a ton during the rest of the day, you just suck up the fact that you are going to uh, have to end up paying twenty, thirty dollars for dinner, um, you know, and that's a, a cheap dinner in, in Geneva. And that, it, but since it's balanced against the fact that you haven't been paying a lot for the rest of the day, it's okay. Um, and, and that's you know usually the way I try and go about it. That you know, uh, there there are certainly some less expensive restaurants. If you go into the old city, it's going to get more expensive. Um, there's an area called the Paki, which is right outside of the Palais Wilson. Um, it's, you know, uh, uh, part, parts of it are um, of the, the red light district in Geneva, but it's the Swiss red light district. It's not, you know, threatening. It's, it's very tame. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that that's where your um, kind of the more affordable uh, local restaurants are. But again, it, it's going to run you like probably a minimum of about twenty dollars for dinner. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. Um, that's actually you know right on advice. I, we actually dined in the red light district um, by accident, um, but it was affordable compared to some of the other places around. Um, and I, I I'm not sure if anyone mentioned this before, but um, you know Geneva is a short trip from France. So if you also want to head across the border to get a meal to say that you were in France while you were there, that's also an option. Um, and another good way of stretching your money in Geneva is to eat as a group um, and share a meal. Again, building community um, while you're doing that. Uh, there was a question about uh, the day for the formal briefing. Uh, I believe that was already answered, so I'll just reiterate that it will be on Monday, uh, and this information will be available in your welcome packet during the orientation as well. Um, and I, I do believe that will also be going out to folks before heading out to Geneva. Is that right, Tara? If you're sorry, I was on mute. mute. Yes, yes, that's yes. right. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you're saying, yes, that's right, to people getting their welcome packet prior to Geneva. Yes, we'll be sending out the welcome packets far before Geneva, hopefully later today. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, another question, are there uh, resources available for those wanting to partake in media engagement, such as template for press release and other um, helpful resources? So this is Tara again. Um, I don't have any in my pocket, but we do have a, um, a press person that's come on and I will be um, shipping this to her so that she can um, hopefully create some because I think that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Hi, this is Mike. I'm the communications manager at USHRN. Um, I know that we are putting together at least one uh, press advisory and press release that we can certainly share with people so they can model it. Hopefully we'll be able to create some templates for you as well, but that's not certain yet. And just to add, this is Rebecca with the 
Human Rights Network as well. And within the Civil Society Delegation Packet that we'll be sending out today, there are social media tips. Wonderful. Um, and I think we have one person with their hand raised. Mike, would you want to go ahead and recognize them? Angelique, I think you should be able to speak now uh, if you still have a question for us. And if you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh, you typed it. Okay, Angelique typed her question earlier, so I believe that she's good. Okay. Her question was whether this would be recorded in case she missed some of it. And if everyone didn't see that on the side, yes, this is being recorded and it will be distributed either by the end of the day today or Monday and will be up on our website as well. You'll be able to find it on the bottom of our home page. Fantastic. And we'll send it over email. So multiple ways for you to get this and distribute it. Um, uh, we don't have any more questions, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, reach out to us or Tara um, more specifically to ask her questions. Um, so we want to, this is the contact information for our presenters. Um, we have Eric's information here since he went over um, some of the main pieces about uh, the strategic advocacy while you're in Geneva. Um, and Tara, who is our coordinator um, and handling um, all of our logistics um, and will be in Geneva. So please reach out um, to uh, Tara, I would say primarily. And if you have questions about what Eric has presented, um, please also do so. I believe, Eric, you will also be in Geneva. True. Yes, fantastic. Um, and so here are um, some links to um, several resources. So first is our website uh, where you can find out more about the, the CAT treaty and the review process as well as um, the shadow report summaries that were submitted. Um, if you're not already on our listserv, please join it. Um, I believe there will also be um, a CAT Geneva specific um, listserv for those folks who will be going. Uh, and if you've been in contact with Tara, you will all, you'll be on that listserv. Um, you can also visit our CAT project page for all the resources discussed um, on the call. Um, so once this uh, recording becomes available from any meeting, that will be uploaded there as well. Again, um, please email um, Tara. Uh, this will also be her active email while she's in Geneva. So um, it would be good for you to have this um, and primary contacts. Um, and if you have not already done so, please consider becoming a member of the U.S. Human Rights Network. Um, and you can learn more about um, being a member and all the benefits that, um, that comes with um, from our website. So thank you, Eric, Aliyah, Marcia, um, Tara, and Cindy for a fantastic um, set of presentations, um, and all of you for your wonderful questions and helping to round out and ensuring that you have all that you need to fully participate in this process. Again, any questions, email me and or Tara, um, and we are happy that you were able to join us today.